breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is a failing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place Good morning, West Highland. Let's go. Good morning. Yeah, you got to talk over the mass. Some of you, you look so much better than I remember. Uh, but we're glad to be here. Is it, is it good? Is it good to be together? We're thankful wherever you're joining us. If you're here, if you're riding your bike right now or on the treadmill, or you're on your couch or your bed, it doesn't matter. We're thankful that we can come together. And we're thankful for our... Our media team that each and every week just makes it happen. Isn't that nice? Jeff, thank you. you. Guys in the back, thank you. Wow. Every week it got better. Every week it got better. That's a great thing. When Tom, his sermons, I mean, I, it's hard to look into a camera with me and Jeff Pratt staring at you and preach. 
And so we're thankful that we're able to continue to live stream. We're thankful that we're able to get together. Uh, the fellowship hall is open if you need to be in there. Everything's spaced out for you. The service is in there. Um, so just so you know, I'm just taking this all in. This is great. Today, the offering, we're not going to obviously pass it around. So on your way out, you can put the offering in the plates. We've got security guards in the back that will monitor that. And you can do that when you leave. Also, adults, Pastor Tom's having his class meet here Wednesday. And uh, we'll be following the same kinds of things we're doing today. We do ask you to keep coming in the front door, trying to limit where we are in the building, um, but that's going to be Wednesday, 6.45. The adults will be in the fellowship hall, teens and youth, and, and that, that crew will still be, be zooming away uh, with their different groups. Um, so it's just trying to still get together. And then we also are starting encounter groups, 10 or less people getting together in homes and for encouragement, for some fellowship. And so if you're interested in, in hosting those or, or being involved in one, you can meet with Sue. She's right here in front. You can talk to her. She, she said you can call her. You can text her. She has a fax. You can, okay, she doesn't have a fax, but it just felt like, it felt like that's what that should be said. But you can get a hold of Sue, and she will direct you in, in the way that you should go with those. But those are going to be something that we're really looking forward to as a church being um, transitioning back together. Those are encounter groups. And so I want to uh, draw your attention to the last verse of our reading plan. We've had a two-week reading plan. First things first, hopefully you've been following along. Just like one or two verses for the day. We've put up a couple of pictures on Facebook just to help you, remind you today. Um, but it's Hebrews 10.23 is today. And not that there's a bad verse, but this is a good verse. It says this, let us hold, you ready for this word I use all the time? Unswervingly. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. I love that. I hold on to that. I count on that. I want to thank you for, for being here with your patience. I want to thank you for the grace that you are allowing us as we transition. Pastor Tom and I were talking, we've, we've never gone through something like this before. We've never reopened a church before. And so we're thankful for all the different input. I, I do want to... Um, I do want to take a picture. Like I said, I want to see you smile with your teeth. And uh, I just want to, this is different. This is so different than what we're used to. And uh, it's just exciting to, to be together. So I want you to turn and look down your pew, wave to somebody, wave to somebody, even say hi. <laughs> but we're glad you're here. We are going to have Kiki come. Kids, we've got a special moment just for you. Well, it is a little different for me being in front of a bunch of adults, so I have to say, please bear with me. I am super nervous about this. Usually I'm talking to your kids, and I love talking to your kids, and I have missed all my West Highland kiddos, and I see some of their faces here now, and that makes me so happy. Um, we do now have a children's welcome center in the, fellow, or in the Narthex, and we have little activity packets. So if you didn't stop and get yours, make sure that you do. Um, and you can bring that activity packet back with you each week, and we'll have something else for you there too. So you can stop in and say hi to, uh, I'll be there, or Miss Sue will be there, or maybe we'll even make Miss Patina or Miss Sharon be there for a week and say hi to you guys, because we all miss you terribly. Um, but I felt really weird having a children's sermon and not having a kid up here with me. So I invited our family friend, JJ. JJ, would you mind coming up and joining me? Oh, you got your leg stuck, JJ. There you go. Hi, everybody. This is our family friend, JJ. You know, actually, Pastor Andy and Mr. Jeff found him hanging out at the church during quarantine. So instead, he's been staying with us at our house, but he still comes back every Sunday. And Pastor Andy says he's been a huge help with the sermons. So, you know, just, and you might have even gotten to see him last week when we got to do our family um, song that we did for the service. Um, he, JJ was able to join us for that too. 
And I'm really thankful that he's here with me because it makes me feel better about being up here, if I'm being quite honest. Um, hey, JJ, I see you brought some things with you. You have a lot of suckers. Why do you have suckers? I brought them for the parade. JJ, there isn't going to be a parade. What do you mean? I, I mean, I, I'm not sure where you got the idea there's going to be a parade. Why would you think there's going to be a parade? Because we do that to celebrate Memorial Day every year. Oh, I understand the confusion now. I told JJ that we were celebrating Memorial Day here today at church. So you have brought hold me over suckers and your flag to celebrate the parade. JJ, I'm not sure we can get a parade to go through the church. I don't think that's a thing that can happen, but we are still going to celebrate Memorial Day today by having a video of all of our service members from families and friends of our church. I like movies. Yeah, it'll be right there on the big screen, so it should be really fun to watch. Um, however, when I told you you and I were going to celebrate Memorial Day, you and I were going to talk about some Bible verses that help us remember Memorial Day or think about Memorial Day. You know, in my Bible study that I've been doing at home, it was really cool because they talked about this week how God calls his people to change the world by not hiding but going into some pretty dangerous situations. Whoa, like how dangerous, Miss Kiki? Well, Esther risked her life to save the people of Israel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego literally walked into a fiery furnace to change the heart and mind of a king. And Daniel went into a lion's den, and he changed a lot of things when he did that. The king made it available so people could pray to other gods. I like cats. Their own god, the real god, cats. Well, okay, walking into a lion's den is a little bit more than walking into cats. Um, maybe not for you, because you're made of fluff and stuff. I'm made out of meat. <laughs> I think walking into a lion's den might be a little different for me than it would be for you. Although I'd still be worried about your fluff and stuff. But you're also a kid, so I'm not sure that you're going to be doing anything like walking into a lion's den, because you're staying with Mr. Jeff and I, and like all little kids, it's their parents' job to keep them safe, and right now, we're your parents. So we're not going to let you do that either. And I don't want to see any of my kids here walking into a lion's den either. I'm not sure your parents would appreciate that. So we're not going to try that. Um, but the Bible does tell us in John 15, 13, that there's no greater love than a man laying down his life for a friend. And that's exactly what the members of our armed services or armed forces get, have the opportunity and they risk themselves to do for our freedoms here and in other places. They're showing the ultimate example of love that way. And do you know who they got that example from? Who, Miss Kiki? They got it from Jesus. Jesus did that exact same thing. He showed the ultimate example of love by laying his life down for all of us. He did that for me? He did do that for you, JJ. And he did it for all the other little boys and girls too. And the adults. Usually you're not here when I'm talking to the kids. So, But he did that for all the kids. And I hope that they have the opportunity to understand that and have a relationship with Christ the way that I know you and I both do. You know what I think we should do, JJ? What? I think we should pray for all of our boys and girls and our adults that they also learn that Christ's sacrifice was the greatest show of love. Can you do that with me, JJ? Yes, Miss Kiki. Okay, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for showing us the ultimate example of sacrifice. Thank you for our men and women in our church and in our community who have gone into fight battles and sacrificed themselves as well. We thank you for their love and we thank you for their example. And we thank you for their families that have had to walk through that tough times with them or without them. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us. Amen. Amen. All right, JJ, I think we are done up here, and I think we're supposed to give it over to the praise team now. So why don't you and I skedaddle back to our seats? Thank you, JJ, Kiki. I, I, I want to 
I want to let you know there's some big birthdays this week before we sing. Roy Moore. Are you allowed to say the ages? Is that? We're going to. Roy Moore is turning 80 this, this week, which is it's impressive. That's impressive. Happy birthday, Roy. And then there's one more. Jerry Liss is just a touch older. She's going to be turning 90. And so happy birthday to you if you're watching. I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Let's stand. We'll worship together. Tries to hide and trembles at. 
strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depth of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. When called upon to defend and liberate, they said yes. They found courage to rise with every sun, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command. Even in the darkest hours, they said yes. They cherished and fought for freedom so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them, saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. Let's, uh, let's uh, pray.
Father, when we think of uh, the freedoms that we have, we are humbled, we are grateful. We are hopeful. And we're thankful uh, during a a tumultuous time for our country that there is one, there is the Prince of Peace. Who tells us all through scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. I'll heal. I'll heal their lives. I'll heal their land. I will be their God. They will be my people. So we pray for that today in our country. That there would be peace. We're mindful of the importance in throughout all of Scripture that we have a God of justice, we have a God of righteousness, we have a God of truth. So we pray for those three things to be exhibited today in decisions that are being made by leaders and by those uh, who are struggling, by those who are hurting, by those who are oppressed, Justice, righteousness, and peace. We pray that for the hearts and minds. We pray that as we share together today about those who have uh, given the ultimate sacrifice, that it might speak to our hearts about our lives as we honor them and remember the privileges that we have today have been won by blood, sweat, and toil over years. And people have given their lives that we might sit freely today and worship our Lord and our God. So we pray for that. We, we pray that we share together from the word of God that it might minister to hearts and minds and encourage us today in the things of God. And this is our heart and this is our prayer. And, uh, Lord, be with us as we share together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, it's good. It's good. I, uh, it's like a piece of you is missing, you know. You go through the motions of every week and every day and and, uh, and I, Chelsea, I haven't seen you, you know, <laughs> in forever, it seems. And others, you know, white cops are back, and I knew you were back. And uh, others, uh, Torky, I see you a lot. You're hanging around. Yeah, that's good. It's always good to see you. Humphrey, good to see you. And uh, others that we haven't seen in a while, except some of you just by TV. And uh, that's good, but it's not good, good enough, right? So it's good to see faces and eyes, and, and sometimes when you drop your mask, you'll see a smile. And, uh, but, it's, but it's good. It's good. Memorial Day, we, we, um, we missed it, or did we? Or did we? If you're free today, and you're breathing today, it's Memorial Day. Every day is Memorial Day. Individual liberty is a big deal in Scripture. It's a big deal in the Word of God. Uh, In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, we read these words from the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to read several passages very quickly before I uh, launch into what I want to say. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. And if you drop down into that same chapter in the 13th verse, it says, for you were called to freedom, not to use your freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but through love to serve one another. 
Through love, serve one another with this freedom that you have. And Galatians 5.13 says, you were called to freedom. All right? You were called to freedom. 2 Corinthians says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. 1 Peter chapter 2. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. In John 8, verse 32 that we looked at several weeks ago, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And then Romans, the last one I wanted to look at. Romans 8 and verse 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. As I read through those and I look through all of Scripture, it seems to me, and and, and, and just what is shown to us in life, is that freedom always comes with a price. It always comes with a price. It doesn't matter if you are addressing those who gave their lives for their country for freedom or spiritual freedom. It doesn't matter. It's still the same. Memorial Day, and, and you, if, you, if you listen to speeches, they always kind of go to this as to the beginnings of it. Memorial Day originally was a day set aside to remember those who died in the Civil War. It's where it all began. It was then extended to honor the dead in all wars, men and women who stepped forward and said yes, who answered the call when their nation needed their service. They came from New Jersey, from Tennessee, from Texas, from Idaho, from the great wild west. They came together. They came from city and from suburbs and from farms, from the mountains of the west and the east, from shore to shore. Soldiers, Marines, Navy, Air Force, Army, National Guard, they came. Individuals who loved and were loved, had hobbies, they had jobs, they had odd jobs, who ultimately died in places like Normandy, Korea, Valley Forge, Omaha Beach, Hiroshima, Port Chop Hill, Macon Delta, Okinawa, Vietnam, Germany, Iran, Afghanistan, and even on our own soil. Some names are etched in a black wall in Washington and in other monuments throughout D.C. Others, as you've traveled through this country and gone through small towns and large cities, there are old stones in the middle of those town squares. Our land honors the dead. Some are remembered on markers in foreign fields. They never made it home. Others are laid to rest in unmarked graves. Our republic is a unique place. This country is a unique country. The notion that we have value, every person has value, that we have rights, Bestowed by God, and we can only be ruled through the consent of the governed. That remains as fresh today as when it was framed by the founding fathers. From the very beginning, service in our armed forces was different than in other nations. The oath that soldiers swore was to the Constitution, not to a race, not to a place. Our service members swore fidelity to an idea, to freedom, to liberty, to justice for all. So we remember those who sacrificed their lives 
We remember those. These were real men, real women, not, not saints. They were men and women. And I remember those, many of those guys in my own life. Paul Gunther, who I played ball with for years in high school. Ron Tremer, who I used to walk to school with that served. Tom Gibbons, Anthony Clacco, Bert Hicks, normal guys, normal people, real people, real people. In December of 2000, Congress passed a resolution called the National Moment of Remembrance that asked Americans to pause at three o'clock in the afternoon for a duration of one minute to remember those who had died in military service to the United States. And I want to take a moment just right now. I want you to stand. I want to take a moment, one minute, and to pause and remember those who gave their lives, if we would. You may be seated. Can anything be more ironic than our nation's military? And think about it. Think about it. They love America. So they spend long years in foreign lands far away from home. They revere freedom yet they sacrifice their own so that others can be free. They defend their right to live as individuals, yet they surrender their individuality when they join the armed first forces. And perhaps the most paradoxical of all, they value life, yet they're ready themselves to die. And they get ready to die. On November 19th, 1863, Abraham Lincoln stood on the battlefield at Gettysburg. And there he dedicated a portion of the land as the National Cemetery. The featured speaker of the day wasn't Lincoln. It was a guy by the name of Edward Everts possibly the greatest orator of his time. Former United States Senator, Governor of Massachusetts, President of Harvard University, and he spoke for more than two hours. Two hours. To an audience of about 25,000 people. It was a masterful address. Traumatic in its presentation. And then after a musical interlude, the President of the United States, Lincoln, was formally introduced, and the people settled back into their chairs on the grass to listen. And Lincoln spoke simply, he spoke clearly, startled people by the brevity of his remarks. And after the opening sentence, he spoke what we know today as the Gettysburg Address. We memorized this when I was in eighth grade. We had to memorize the, the Gettysburg Address. Now remember the sounds of war, the blood, the pain, the separation, the nation that's been torn apart is still fresh. The hurt is still there. And he gets up and he begins to speak. And he says those now infamous words. 
We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot concentrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, which take we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That here we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. As troubled as we are today as a nation, we are one nation still because of the great battle that has been fought. The Civil War, New Orleans, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Charleston, Someone said these words, and I don't know who it is. It's unknown. They said, our flag does not fly because the wind moves it. Our flag flies with the last breath of each soldier who died protecting it. I don't know. I don't know what it's like to put my life on the line for the freedom of our country. I never served in the military. Actually, I was drafted the height of the Vietnam War. I remember this whole thing very well. It was in the late 60s and the early 70s. And I had gotten drafted and I uh, had, with some other young men in the church, went forward. We had gotten Bibles. They prayed over us. And we were ready. I had gotten a letter telling me where I was to report over in Chicago. And, uh, and I got a second letter. Surprise to me. I was, with everyone else, going to be put into what was called the draft lottery. Richard Nixon was the president of the United States at that time. And on August 5th, 1971, when the draft lottery numbers were drawn for those who were to serve in Vietnam, my number was 172. They took men up to 95, number 95. I have to tell you, quite honestly, I was relieved. I was relieved. I saw what Vietnam did to many of my friends that served from high school. Many didn't come back. We watched on the nightly news with Walter Cronkite and every night on the nightly news, they would have a body count up in the right hand corner. And we would sit and we would watch. How many have died? How many died? And we watched 
it was kind of the first time because TV was, uh, and color TV didn't start until the 60s. We were watching things in color and we were watching a war. We were watching a war. We were watching people go through the jungles of Vietnam, the, the, the brutality that was there. And we were watching the body count. And as I watched those who came back, those people were changed forever. They were changed forever. Some friends that I had grown up with, and I mentioned just a few of them, some that went that were just fun, loving, caring people came back different. They came back cold. They came back hard. And even those who didn't die physically fighting in Vietnam came back. They died emotionally. They died spiritually. And they didn't get purple hearts. They didn't get purple hearts, but their lives were changed. In fact, thousands of soldiers who returned from Vietnam didn't come home to a hero's welcome. You know the story. There was no ticker tape parade. The Vietnam vets quietly slipped back into society, many with deep emotional wounds. And I don't know how you feel about war, The reality is it doesn't matter. We have wars. We have wars. Many have already given their lives. Husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters have all felt the the bitterness and the sting of war. Those who gave and are giving so much of themselves in service to their country deserve the full honor and full respect, whether or not we like the politics of things or not, behind the military actions that are taken. War is never honorable. George Patton, I think, rightly stated, as many others did, that war is hell. War is hell. The reality of freedom, that we have freedom, Wars have to be fought, lives have to be lost, blood is shed in order to secure freedoms. Freedom comes on the backs of dedicated people. Listen to this now very famous, and you've heard it before, words of a small town mayor by the name of William Roseman. He said this, we have a job. And it is to remind those who do not remember that it's the soldier, not the reporter, who has given us the freedom of the press. It's the soldier, not the poet, who's given us the freedom of speech. It's the soldier, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom to demonstrate. It's the soldier, not the preacher, who has given us the freedom of religion. It's the soldier who serves beneath the flag, who salutes the flag, whose coffin is draped by that same flag, who allows the protester to burn the flag. It is the soldier, not the politician, who has given us his blood, his body, his life, who has given us these freedoms. It is the soldiers who have given us the privilege to sleep safely in our homes and to hold our children warm in our arms. It is the greatest crime, he continues, that it is only war that brings peace, and it is the greatest sacrifice that men and women are struck down in the prime of their lives so that we might enjoy these freedoms. It is for we, the living, to prove that we are worthy of their sacrifice through dedication toward this hard-fought peace that was purchased by these honored dead. End quote. Powerful words. True words. The cost of freedom. The cost of freedom. There is nothing more precious than we have than our freedom other than our Lord. Our Lord. The Bible always calls it, and that's why I started that in Galatians, the the Bible always calls it liberty, freedom, liberty. We have liberty. Makes us appreciate our freedom more than we realize for what cost has been paid. And I put on the screen just some of that cost. There's just a few. 
There are so many more. Civil War, 700,000. World War I, 116,000. World War II, 500,000. Korean War, 37,000. Vietnam War, 58,000. Persian Gulf War, 280. Afghanistan, <laughs> 2,500. Iraq War, 4,497. It takes special people to be willing to give their lives for others. For others. As we think of the selflessness and the heroism of these men and these women, we're reminded of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. The sacrificial love that Jesus described is well known by veterans. William Manchester, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, he was a sergeant in the Marine Corps in World War II. And he suffered a light wound in Okinawa and was taken to a field hospital. And after a time in the hospital, he learned that his unit was scheduled to make an amphibious assault behind the Japanese lines. He went a WOL from the hospital to rejoin his unit, got terribly wounded in the ensuing battle. And Manchester later wrote that he couldn't explain why he left the safety of the field hospital to place himself again in the battle. Except, he says, that it was love. It was love. He couldn't bear the thought of his buddies in moral danger without him being there to help. That's love. That's a great love. Jesus goes on to say, you're my friends. You're my friends. When Jesus told his disciples that he'd come to set them free in John 8, little did they realize that that freedom is going to cost Jesus his life. Those were his friends. We are his friends. In Matthew 20, it says, Jesus is speaking, for the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. So we were held in death's grip by sin. Prisoners of war, if you will. And our sin is what put us there. And yet Jesus, the only one who was innocent, went to the cross to set us free. Even though the sacrifices of our war dead have been great, and they have, the greatest sacrifice of all time was made by a man on a cross who died not only to free us physically, but to free us spiritually. That men and women might live. And we've neglected Jesus in this country too long. Too long. We have rejected his plan for peace. And as a result, people are bleeding and dying. And they've been dying for centuries. His name was Eugene Janauskas. Eugene Janauskas. Grew up in my neighborhood in Chicago, just outside Chicago. We were like the first suburb out in the Berwyn Cicero. I went to school with him, grade school, into high school. Little guy, big ears. He just, just took out like this. His teeth were black. <laughs> and he had a big smile. And we'd all go down to the schoolyard, about 12, 14, 15 of us go down to the schoolyard on Saturdays and play ball. Neighborhood schools. He went to Vietnam, Nam as they called it, Nam. He went to Nam. He was one of the ones that came back. And he talked with me about an incident that happened to him while he was in Vietnam. And I don't remember all the details, but I remember this. 
Eugene was a helicopter gunner. And while on the mission flying over the jungles of Vietnam, they were looking for snipers, he said. The helicopter experienced mechanical problems. The pilot landed on a place that he could find a clearing and radioed for help, but it was going to be a long time in coming. It wasn't a good place to be. It wasn't a good place to be. So Eugene and the rest of his buddies, his friends, started to make their way back through this hot, sticky jungle, back to camp. Night came, pitch black. They're in the jungle. They're still moving. They hadn't reached the camp. And Eugene said that there were shots, they were always being shot at. They were always being fired at. There were mortar shells that lit up the sky. There were other American troops that were in the area. And he and his best friend decided to dig a trench to provide some protection from the shrapnel. They were spraying all around them and exploding because of the mortar shells. And I'll never forget him telling me this. We were sitting in a booth in Connie's restaurant. It was about three blocks from my house. And that Connie's is still there today. Right across from the railroad tracks is the Berwyn train station for the commuter Burlington tracks that take people down to Chicago to work. I lived to the right about three blocks. South Harlem Avenue. South. Eugene says they dug their trench and he heard a noise from behind. And he turned to check out the noise that he'd heard from behind and he stopped talking. And Eugene looked down and things got difficult. The words short. The words came harder. He said, my friend shoved me to the ground. And he was startled. He didn't know what was happening. He said, I remember picking myself up off the ground and cussing at my friend for shoving me and knocking me down. And he, tears. And we're sitting at this restaurant. He said he looked toward his friend only to see him lying on the ground with the upper part of his body blown to pieces. And he said this, I stood there with my best friend's blood covering my body. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And while telling the story, Eugene was choking back to tears, reliving. And he said softly to me, he said, Tom, I just cursed my f- best friend who died saving my life. Died saving my life. We owe a lot of gratitude to the veterans whom have given their lives for freedom. The last full measure of devotion, right? The last full measure of devotion. The greatest debt we owe to Jesus Christ who shed his blood while we were still enemies of God to set us free from sin and eternal death. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. And I'll close with this. We stand before God the Father covered with the blood of the greatest friend 
we could ever know or ever have. Jesus shoved us aside and went to the cross in our place so we could live free and in freedom from sin, from death. And I close as I started with Scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, For you were bought with a price. You're not your own. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belongs to God. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand firm. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Let's pray together. So our Father, we sit here today in freedom to worship, to pray. And we're thankful. We're thankful for those who paid the ultimate price. We're thankful for Jesus who understands that, who knows that kind of love, who exhibited that love. And he came to die for us. And we're thankful for this country. And we do pray for our leaders. We pray for those who are navigating these troubled waters now. And we pray for peace. We pray for the Prince of Peace to come into hearts and lives. Let justice roll down and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And that comes from the heart of God to a troubled people. Again, we thank you. We, we, Father, we know that every day is Memorial Day, not only for those who gave their lives, but as we think of what you've done for us, that we breathe free today because of you, that we're free from eternal death, that we have life everlasting because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And we thank you for that. We ask, Lord, that you, you speak into hearts and minds, that we would continue to remember that with humbleness and uh, with gratefulness. And we ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. America, the beautiful, huh? spacious sky for amber waves of gray for purple mountain majesty above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Father, we're thankful today for, for being here to worship together. We're thankful for your great love. We, as we leave, we leave with joy in our hearts, but yet humbled. Grateful people. We have a great country, a great land. Father, the greatest thing is the peace that we have in our own hearts. This deep peace that no matter what happens around, there's a peace that we know inside. And that we can pray. We can pray. If we can ask God, our Father, 
to send the Holy Spirit across this land, across this country, and to speak to hearts and lives, to energize your church, your people, not just for the sake of our freedoms here, but for eternal freedoms that we have in Christ. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for uh, our friends in the Lord who are here, uh, greeting one another. Uh, and what a joy it is to be back in, in fellowship. We ask, Lord, to continue to be with us throughout this week. And, and uh, thank you. Thank you for our eternal freedoms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.